I would like for you all to please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 4. We're going to look at the first 11 verses of Matthew 4. And as you all turn there, the title for today's message is Preparing and Living Through Suffering. Preparing and Living Through Suffering. So as you all turn there, I have a couple questions to ask as we begin. Are you currently going through a hardship in your life? Or do you know someone that is going through a hard time? Or maybe you're feeling the weight of living in the sinful world that we live in, a world that is fighting wars. Thousands and thousands are being killed that are unborn. The health pandemics that we're going through. Loved ones fighting cancer. Divisions in families. Or maybe at your work, it's not popular to be a Christian. I want to begin by stating that some, that suffering, excuse me, is something that every Christian will experience either directly or indirectly in their life. When I mean suffering, I'm speaking specifically to hardship, persecution related to our life in Christ and as we live in this sinful world. With this definition in mind, as I came to prepare this message, I thought a lot about my, my past and looking into the future and really being encouraged but also convicted that why am I so surprised and why am I sometimes caught flat-footed or unprepared when these arise? And I know today our world desperately needs hope, and we all know needs the hope of, of Jesus ultimately. But today's message centers on the Christian's model for preparing and facing sufferings, which again, every believer will experience. And now I have to caveat, as we get ready to get into the text, I'm not going to give you five steps to rid the sufferings and, you know, get a Corvette, you know, and or, you know, like the best life now, you know, like it's just some wave a magic wand and, and the hardship's over. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to do is dive into the text and, and show how Jesus gave us the ultimate model of not only preparing for suffering, living through suffering, but glorifying God through his suffering on the cross. And I'm going to do that in a couple ways this morning. We're going to read the text, and then I'm going to go through some observations that I've experienced you know, studying that I'd like to share that God show me from the first 11 verses. And then I'm going to give three applications at the end. Now, I'm just going to give these applications up front so you can kind of think about it as we go through the message. But those three applications from Matthew 4, 1 through 11 are these. One, there's a preparation for suffering. Two, there is a calling to suffering. And three, there is a purpose in suffering. Again, those three applications I'll hit later. But let's, let's uh, dive into the text. And if you could follow along with me, I'm going to be reading from Matthew 4, 1 through 11 in the English Standard Version. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their ha hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you fall down, and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. 
the word of the Lord. So as we begin, I'm going to give some quick context of what's going on here in Matthew 4. So in Matthew 4, we know that the author here is Matthew, the, the tax collector, all right? And I mentioned this in the last service. If you haven't had the chance to watch The uh, Chosen, uh, my children, the boys at Riverside that I get to be with every day, what a blessing. They have, that, that show has really captured the faith for them in a lot of ways. And The Chosen does a great job capturing this guy, Matthew, who's at this tax collector's booth and how Jesus changes his life. So we know the author, Matthew, okay? And this story is depicted in, in Mark and Luke as well. But in this setting, only one chapter prior, Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist, and we see God the Father and the Holy Spirit is beautiful. You know, it gives us this clear depiction of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we see God saying, you are my son who I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove. And from that, you would think, all right, it's going to be, we're, we're just off to the races. It's going to be great. There's going to be all these prosperity and great things that are about to happen, right? And then it's like, wait, Jesus goes from that experience to being led by the Spirit into hardship. Okay, so I think it's important that we see what's going on there. And as he's being led by the Spirit, again, some very quick contextual and things as well, is he moved from the eastern side of the Jordan River to the western side near the Dead Sea at a place known today as Mount Temptation. Okay, if you look it up, if you Google it, okay, it's this mountain that's about 1,200 feet, okay? But that trek from where Jesus was to the mountain is very arduous, very difficult, very desolate terrain. It's, 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 it's a hard place to be. There's a lot of barrenness, jagged rocks. And yes, there are people that have made that trek, but scholars and archaeologists and those that have done it said it's a very dangerous trek. So this is, this is Jesus. He's not vacationing in this grandiose place. Okay? It's a very difficult, hard place. So with that geography in mind, with it, what had just happened, let's look back into the text. And as we dive into verse 1, okay, I'm going to go through this kind of verse by verse quickly, is there are several observations that I'd like to point out this morning. One, we see that the Spirit, again, had just been a part of his baptism, leads him out into the wilderness, leads him out. Mark 1.12 even says that, and again, this depiction in Mark, John Mark here says that he was led to be tempted. Okay, so when you, you look at these different uh, versions, different stories of how it's depicted, in the original way it was written, it's Jesus is here being sent out to be tempted, to be tested. And as he's being sent out, there was a purpose for him going. This wasn't just a random act. He was sent out on this hardship for a reason, and we're going to get into that here. And in these initial verses, Jesus being fully God could have said, I'm not, I'm not going out there. I'm God. You know, I'm Jesus. I'm God. I'm not going out there. But he submitted himself. He submitted himself to the Spirit's leading and is, and is sent out. And in his perfect submission, we also see another key thing from this passage is that in Jesus being sent out, he's sent out in a way, as a human, we experience, he experiences hunger, he experiences hardship. He experiences being alone, right? He experiences being rejected. And a lot of these same things are experiences that unfortunately we go through, right? But he, he is not some far distant off person. He has lived the life that we have lived, but he lived it perfectly. And that perfect submission and that relation to us as believers is so important. And as we look into the submission we see this reliance on the Holy Spirit. And through Christ's obedience, not only here, but ultimately through dying and re being resurrected, we see that leading up to his death, Jesus says, I'm going to be the sender of the Spirit. And there's this beautiful, we know, eternal communion between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But in John 14 and 16, he says, I'm going to send you a helper, a counselor. Okay? 
He's going to send the Spirit. And praise God, in Acts, we see the Spirit descending okay, on His believers. But what is the Spirit's role right now before and leading into Jesus' life? I think it's important to see from His earthly ministry. We know that the Spirit was involved in the authors of the Old Testament prophesying about Jesus, Jesus coming to earth. We also see the Spirit's role in His incarnation. We also, and then Luke 1, His baptism, as I mentioned. And in Luke 4, the Spirit is very clearly involved in the power in Jesus' ministry. And later in Romans, the empowering and part of His resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, here, Jesus submits to the Spirit's direction and goes out into the desert. And as he goes out, I had to just do a look. I said, hey, you know, how long can a human really go without food and without water? And I know they go back and forth on this. Uh, it's, doctors say around 21 days. But not only was Jesus without food, okay, but he was tempted by Satan himself. Talk about like, the pinnacle of hardship, right? And in that, why 40 days and why fast? Again, Jesus had just been acknowledged by God the Father. You are my son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit comes down on him. Why would he need to go through this, this hardship? Well, first, in this 40 days, it's just interesting. I'm not necessarily drawing a conclusion, but just an observation these 40 days have a lot of meaning in Scripture. How long was Noah in the ark? Okay. How long was Moses on top of Mount Sinai when he received the Ten Commandments? 40 days, right? Okay, how long was Israel wandering? Pretty neat, right? In every case, the 40 days, nights, and years came just before something was about to significant was about to happen. And in this fasting for Jesus and being alone, I could imagine the deep communion that he had with God during that time, deep dependence. But there was also preparation that was going on for Jesus' earthly ministry that, of what was about to happen. Because this wasn't the only time Satan tempted him. He tempted him all the way till he almost, you know, did... You don't need to go on the cross. You don't need to do that. He kept attacking him. And I thought about that, and I thought about my own example. And Pastor Taylor, yes, did tell, me, did tell you all about my uh, military experience. One of the courses that I fortunately and unfortunately had to go through was Army Ranger School. Okay, and um, one, of the, one of the phases in, is in Dahlonega. Okay, and I, I told the last service, and I hope you all aren't offended by this, but I thought I'd never come back here. I didn't want to come back here because I had such a traumatic experience up on the uh, mountains of Dahlonega. <laughs> it was cold, it was wet, and I was hungry all the time. And I, I don't know how I stayed awake. I probably didn't. But you don't get much sleep and much food during that course. But as a young officer, as a young leader, I needed to go through that hardship. I needed to go through that experience for my own maturity and my own growth. And what did I learn in that? And I'm not in any way trying to equate my experience with what Christ went through. But I can tell you from my own hardship and experience, I learned so much about myself. Where I fall short, my weaknesses, I learned the importance of being a good teammate and relying on others. Sounds like a lot of like life, right? I also learned that I really value food and sleep. And so I made a long list and my poor wife had to take me to all those places <laughs> to eat. But I really enjoyed and cherished food a lot more because when I didn't have it, boy, it really made me grateful when I did have it. And we all love sleep, right? <laughs> and when you're not, you don't get much sleep, again, you value it. But above all that, it was a deep communal time that I had with God. And it was really neat to see believers, Christians, in such a difficult course we all came together and we were like, hey, let's lift each other up and let's also be a witness because people come around, hey, why are you so optimistic? And, and maybe at times we weren't necessarily, but we knew we needed to be a good witness. And in that hardship, is a great opportunity to witness to non-believers in that course. But why did Jesus 
need to go through the suffering? Have we ever thought about that as believers? Couldn't he have just got, came down to earth real quick, got on the cross, and got it over and done with, if you will? Not to delegitimize, but just to do that, or for God just to say, all right, sins, they're, all, they're forgiven, right? We're good to go. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, I won't read it, but if you want to write it down, the author of Hebrews talks about Jesus needing to learn perfect obedience. Well, wait, he's God. What does he need to learn about obedience? Again, things that I was thinking and praying through as I prepared this message. I think there's a critical lesson that we can not only encourage our, ourselves with, but that we can share with others about our Christian faith. Because here's the thing, having been around the world in a lot of different places, other faiths aren't talking about hardship, right? And aren't talking about a dependence. There's a lot of other religions talking about what you can do about it. Just tighten your bootstraps. You can do it. You can do it, right? And that, hey, we're working towards happiness right now, right? And you don't need to deal with that suffering. But Jesus models for us what we're supposed to be doing here on earth. And I'm not saying run to suffering, but when it does come, how do we be faithful in that? So Jesus gives us the answers to these of why he needed to suffer. First, in Luke 9.22, he tells his disciples that he needed to suffer, that it was part of God's plan. Jesus uses the words, the Son of Man, again, this this reference back to Daniel and others, as a son of man, he must, he uses the word must suffer. So the son of man must suffer. Secondly, yes, Jesus already knew obedience. He was in a perfect communion with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But for us as Christians, God in his grace brought his son down to earth and experienced hardship and suffering and remained faithful being what we were intended to be, but unfortunately because of sin, we are not. And God in His grace gave us the example of fulfilling the life that we all fall short in doing, a life of obedience and honor to God. And again, back to other religions, this, this is the critical piece too, is not only this call to suffering, but we also have a Savior that we can run to, that we can be at the feet at, that we can worship. Yes, He is Lord, but he knows our sufferings. He knows our pains. So maybe if you're here today or you know a family member or somebody that's struggling, we can say, brother, sister, let's run to Jesus. Inside my West Point class ring, I have Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where it says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. This, etern- this eternal rest. But in that, before that weary and heavy laden, there is going to be hardships. Certainly, Jesus knows our, our hardships. And he is the example that we are to follow. And as preparing this message, I'm reading a really good biography of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a, a, one of the most renowned Christian leaders, um, part of the Reformation that happened many centuries ago. And during the 1500s, he grew up and his family had aspired for him to be a lawyer. Okay, a lawyer was a very, like today, a very renowned profession. It made a lot of money. His parents didn't come from much, but they sent him to schooling. He went to college or young age, and Luther was very, very smart. Incredibly smart. In 1503, he was coming back from school, and he, I don't remember why, but he had a big sword. Okay, he carried around the sword. The sword cut his leg, and it cut his leg so bad that he was bleeding so fast he he should have died. He laid on the ground bleeding, and he prayed out to St. Anne, St. Anne, save me, St. Anne, save me. He was thankfully, his leg, through some trial and error, was healed. And not only several years later, in 1505, as he prepared for law school, a massive thunderstorm came down on him. And who did he pray out to again? St. Anne again. 
he thought that praying to her would get him closer to Jesus because Jesus is some distant being. He's, yes, he's God, but he's so far off. I got to go through basically these layers to get to him. When he became a monk, and he became a monk because he wanted to work his way up the ladder, per se, to heaven, because he thought that's what you had to do. He would go to confession with another priest for six hours, confessing any, any sin that he had. It wasn't until he opened the Bible and started teaching it and reading through passages like in Romans 3 and Romans 6 that he began to see that, yes, God is Lord. He is King of kings. But he is also the suffering servant and that he calls us to come to him. And in that, that radically changed his life. And I know it's changed all of us. If you look back with me in verse 3 of Matthew 4, here Satan is, is called the tempter. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. This first temptation deals with the temptation I know we all can struggle with. It's this meeting our physical needs, this instant gratification, right? I, I need it. I need it now. And yes, we need to eat. We need to sleep. We need monetary. We, we've got to live, right? But there was a plan for Jesus during that time, that 40 days, okay? And Satan wanted to thwart that plan and say, hey, if you are the Son of God, so he's not only tempting him with food, okay? And being a ranger student, if someone dangled that, I'd probably run to it. <laughs> being hungry, right? But turn these stones to bread. So one, meet your physical needs, okay? And eat, eat this, which because he knew he could do it. But he's wanting him to go away from what God had planned for him. In doing so, Satan hoped that the joy, the satisfaction, the instant gratification would thwart Jesus and disobey God. And it's interesting that Satan did the same thing to Adam and Eve in the in Garden of Eden. He said, did God really do that? If he really said that, right, he wants to create doubt. And he's trying to do that to Jesus. But in verse 4 of Matthew 4, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Okay, and he's going to quote Deuteronomy several times in this, in this section that we're in. And I had to ask myself, and I ask you all today, do we value God's word and his truth more than anything? Is that the first thing that we run to, that we hold on to, and that we say to ourselves and that we combat against Satan with God's truth? Do we long for his word? Do we memorize? Do we pray? Do we commune with God's word? If you even have this Bible anywhere remotely public in Afghanistan, you're executed. You're done. Okay? But we as Americans, praise God, we don't have that struggle, right? Okay? And I'm not saying that to intimidate or but we have a great blessing, this word in front of us. Do we value and cherish it? For Jesus, did he value and treasure it more than food after he had not eaten for 40 days? An incredible example. And as we move on in our text, in verse 5, the devil took him to, a whole, to, to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, okay? So as he does that, Satan, again, being cunning and smart, he actually quotes Scripture, right? And he quotes from Psalm 91. And in that, he not only quotes Scripture, but he he's, thinks he's smart, and he's going to, again, try and cast doubt. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, okay? Trying to plant that seed of doubt. I don't know about y'all, but I doubt a lot. And he creates, he, he's trying to create that foundation of doubt in his life at a vulnerable time. And in this second temptation, it's the sin of be, wanting to be more in control 
of casting doubt and lacking trust in God. And more specifically, coming to God with a heart of mistrust or doubt to manipulate a situation for our benefit. We certainly see this in Scripture, and we could easily criticize Israel for casting doubt about God. God, why did you take us out into the wilderness? Why did you take us out in the wilderness? We should just better be off dead, right? And just kept going to God out of mistrust instead of coming to Him in faith. But I, I, I can confess to you all that I've done the same. But Jesus, again, gives us the model of quoting Scripture, and He quotes Deuteronomy 6.16, do not put God to the test. And of note, Deuteronomy, I know it's an Old Testament book and it can be difficult, but I think there's some thought out there today that the Old Testament isn't relevant anymore. We don't need it anymore. Okay, But it's, if Jesus is quoting it and using it, why can't we? Why shouldn't we be reading it? Right? And also, it's not only a book that is long, and yes, sometimes can be difficult to read, but it gives us a beautiful picture of God's plan of, yes, man has fallen, but Deuteronomy talks a lot about the law and the law ultimately pointing to a need for a Savior and this future hope of restoring the world with those who know Him. And so there's great hope in Deuteronomy, and Jesus quotes, quotes it several times here. So looking at myself, and maybe you're in this season as well, I've got a lot of doubts in my heart and my mind right now. Am I coming to Him rooted in unbelief? Or am I coming to Him rooted in trust in His promises and who He is and who He says He is? And why do I doubt what He has done in my life? And Why am I doubting what He will do and what He has done? I love in Hebrews how it talks about keeping our eyes fixed on Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. And as we close the observations before we get into our application, Satan tempts him one more time. Okay, so we see him tempting him physically and mentally. Now he's going to tempt him spiritually. He's tempting him to see if Jesus will go against and go against God and worship Satan and the things of this world. Though physically weak and weary, this is where I think it's beautiful. And, and Luke and Mark capture this maybe a little bit clearer, but Jesus actually says, get away, Satan. And he clearly asserts his authority, and Satan leaves. And in that, what a model of being prepared, of going through the suffering, and glorifying God in that suffering. That was the Ultimately, his purpose was to be what we could never be because of our sin. In paying the price, God is a just God, paying the price for our sin, being our propitiation, substitute for sin's penalty, and giving us a model to follow. And so within these applications, the so what, if you will, there's a couple things that I want to mention here. First, in Jesus' life, we wish we knew more about his childhood, right? Like, okay, we know you're born, but what happened be between like, you know, one or two to like, when, you know, his ministry, we capture like last three years on earth, I think, around he's like 33 or so when he dies. What happened in that childhood time? He said he was a carpenter, so like, what did he build? What did he do, right? <laughs> and, but what we do see is that author Luke says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. What does that mean? Well, we do know that when he says that, okay, Jesus was at the temple, okay, and he was talking back and forth, right? And Mary and Joseph are like, hey, where'd you go? And he's there, right? And he's learning and growing. He's not only growing as a man, right? He's growing up, okay? But more about him is, is being revealed, okay? He's going from, you know, 10, 12, 20, saying, who is this? And he's reading the Word. He's studying the Word. Okay, He's given us a model. While being fully divine, Jesus didn't grasp onto that, but He took on human flesh. 
If you'd like to turn with me, I'm going to read from Philippians 2 that I think really encapsulates this. I'm going to read from Philippians 2, just a couple verses because I think it's very important to see the way Paul describes Jesus. Have this in mind amongst yourselves, I'm reading verse 5 of chapter 2, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross. So in this preparation for suffering, this first application, Jesus loosened that grip, okay, that of fully God, fully man. Yes, he he always was. He had to be to be a perfect sacrifice. But he took on that human form for us. He took on that human form and he grew and he studied God's word. He knew God's word. It, was, it would have been already been way too late if he's in the desert and tries to pull out his Bible. Oh, you know, what, what could be said about being hungry, right? Or whatever. Like he, boom, knew. There's such a value in, in scripture memory and reading the Bible and knowing it and having those foundations. We're getting ready to start football season, right? Okay. All right. We don't, they don't just go into, uh, I don't know who Georgia's, who they playing first. Oregon? Okay, do they, do they just say, you know what, uh, we're going to go play the Oregon Ducks in a few weeks. Just I'll see you in three weeks or whenever. We'll show up. What do they do? They practice. They practice. They what if. They, they work hard, right? Are we doing that in our faith? Are we growing through God's grace in His Word and prayer? It's not enough to know God's Word because Satan knew God's Word, but are we actually applying it? Okay, are we taking God's word and applying it to our life? And I'll tell you from past experiences, I've really struggled in doubt and fear. And I know that the truth is right there, but am I actually picking up and actually applying it and saying it and believing it in my life? In this preparing for suffering, we've talked about God's word, Jesus' humility, but are you an intentional community that sharpens and encourages you? that lifts you up. Don't do the Christian life alone. I plead with you. Don't do the Christian life alone. That's what Satan wants. Okay? And there will be times when, yes, you may be alone. You have to go through something, but don't let that always be the case. Find community. And in this preparation for suffering, I also would like to point out that from Matthew 4, verse 1, okay, I hope I explained it well enough, but we see that Jesus was humbled himself and was led by the Spirit. And that could seem a little bit difficult for us today. Like, what does that mean to be led by the Spirit? Because Paul calls us, in the Galatians particularly, to be led by the Spirit. But I think being led by the Spirit is denying ourselves, taking up our cross and allowing the Spirit, we're not equal with Him, but to walk with Him and allow Him to lead our lives through his word, through prayer, through church. Romans 8, 14 gives us this promise. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And that key word, those who are being led by the Spirit. So are we we allowing the Spirit to lead our lives? Because if it's not, if he's not, then we know that the world will want us to drift and allow the world to lead us. Two two other applications real quick. Along with not only being prepared to suffer, we are also called to suffer. We saw earlier that Jesus said that this was part of his plan, God's plan for his life. And we know that God doesn't give us any suffering without, without giving us the ability, the power to get through it, right? And to glorify him. And that he works all things for good. And yes, can you imagine being Mary, Martha, the disciples, and seeing Jesus on the cross saying, God, what are you doing? The most perfect man, right? Why did he have to go through this suffering? Okay, but in the end, we know that that suffering was for our good. And it, more importantly, glorified God. Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that 
For those who love God, all things work together for good, those who are called according to his purpose. And in this calling, I I alluded to it earlier, but don't do the Christian life alone. I plead with you. I have a dear brother that came here today to who's been a great friend to me, who's here um, encouraging me in this sermon. Thank you for being here. We don't do Christian life alone. I have in the past gone through hardships, again, being, I don't know if y'all know this, but veterans, there are 22 veterans killing themselves a day. It's a huge pandemic with, with, with military that are having a hard time once they leave the service. Struggling with that and then just being a Christian, right? I mean, it's, just, it's hard. And I have at times isolated myself thinking that maybe I can just do it do it on my own or that I don't want to ask for help. And there's a plea that I share with you for me, don't do that. Find intentional Christian community. I know this church is so warm and welcoming. I know you all have that. But if you see someone going through that, you know, be, be that brother or sister to lift up their burdens and to be real and transparent with one another. We've got to do that. Okay, and we've got to build trust with one another, but there needs to be a sense of transparency because, boy, is it hard out there, right? It's hard. It's really hard. Let me reread verse 11. The devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. You say, yes, Jesus had to go through that time, okay? But there's a beauty that we see of community that comes, right? What do the angels come and do? They minister, right, to him. And that's the beauty of intentional Christian community is that we care for one another. We love one another, right? And that's one of the beauties of coming in on Sundays is we come and we worship and we encourage one another. Jesus pleads for this community when he, before he goes to the cross. He calls some disciples over. I believe it's Peter, James, and John. Correct me if I'm wrong. At the, at the garden, he's praying, right? Pray so we don't fall into temptation, and disciples, they kind of rack out and fall asleep. They're sleepy rangers, okay? But he's wanting that community. He calls the disciples up on the Mount Transfiguration. He spends time with his father, models that fellowship. And lastly, though I know this is a heavy subject, there is a purpose in our suffering. The cross was not the end of Christ's story. The desert was not the end of Christ's story. Praise God that we have the hope of eternity and that is our hope. In our current current world that we face, Russia, Ukraine, you name it, all, all the things going around us, a divided nation, we are called to be faithful where we are now. We, ha- we praise God that we have the hope of what is to come. And in the time that we have now, say, well, what's the point right now? But right now, there is a suffering world outside these walls that are looking for hope. Are we modeling for non-believers at our workplace, maybe a difficult member of our family? Are we modeling the humility and the grace and the leaning on God's truth of Jesus in hard times? It's, it's unfortunate, but dependency is not a weakness. I know the world wants to be, oh, just be strong, be independent. And yeah, we do need to be strong, but we... We know that dependency on the Lord is the greatest strength, right? It's the greatest strength. 1 Peter 4, 12, I won't read it because of time, and 13, it says, friends, do not be surprised when suffering comes. And I hope and pray, I'm not saying for us to run and run and find it, but when it does come, I plead with you, know that there is a purpose. We won't know all these things on this side of heaven, but remember, God works all things for good. And lastly, in this purpose, for me, I know I've learned, it loosens the grip that we have on the world and what the, all the things that the world tells us to value and treasure more than anything. I've let my career and other things take such a tight grip, and I've learned in these hardships There's no real way to get around it but to go through them. And as we go through them, there is so much pain and waiting. And maybe you're in a season of waiting. You're in a hardship of waiting. Or you know someone that's waiting and waiting. And what do I do? What do I do? 
we need to not only learn how to fight for our faith, but also how to wait well, which is really hard. I'll tell you, it's really hard to do. But in that waiting, I have been encouraged by this passage. Don't wait with a disgruntled, complaining, or distracted heart, but to wait with contentment and gratitude. To wait in contentment and gratitude. Paul shares this in his own life that he had to learn through experience. And I've had to learn through experience what it means to wait, to be content. So be encouraged, friends. Being satisfied in Christ and giving thanks is where we need to be, particularly in the season that you may be in of waiting. And as we learn to trust God, we continue to do the work in front of us. And we should, I plead with you, repeat these truths in our lives.